A lot of people here today. <clears throat> Can you hear me? Welcome. Thanks, Broadcast Pioneers, for hosting the 50th anniversary and the celebration of B101. Please join me in welcoming the current B101 family and all the former staff and employees of B101. Welcome. <clears throat> I'd like to say my name is Diego Castellanos because it just sounded so cool, but I'm Blaze Howard, Vice President and General Manager of B101. I thought I had a cool name until I heard that one. In 2005, Dave Kurtz, the founder of B101, lost his battle with cancer. We're honored here today to have his family with us. His wife, Esther, his daughter, Ellen, and her husband, Stephen, their son, David, and his wife, Jennifer, and Anna is here, who's going to be working for us this summer, which is great. We'll be hearing from Dave a little bit later with some remarks, but we'd like to thank the Kurtz family for joining us today. Thank you so much. I remember when I first met Dave Kurtz, he reminded me of someone. He reminded me of a movie star, Jimmy Stewart. Dave was soft-spoken, humble, well-liked, respected, someone you generally like to be around. He was the epitome of a gentleman. When I first met Jerry Lee, he also reminded me of someone. Bond. James Bond. <laughs> but that's a story for another, another dinner. Dave and Jerry are two different men with two different styles. One might say that they are complete opposites, but they were a perfect match for business. They were two men with big dreams. The strength of these two individuals complemented each other in such a way that their collaboration was inevitable. The best ideas and insight of an engineer combined with the best ideas and instincts of a marketing creative whiz produced an exceptional, exceptional radio company. Back in the late 50s and early 60s, when major broadcast companies were giving back their FM license to the FCC, Dave Kurtz had the vision of FM stereo and what it could be. He knew that with the technological advances of the time, he could get a station up and running. And Jerry Lee had the vision for creating an innovative ideas for the station, such as the Radio Project in 1986 where B101 gave away 50,000 custom-built fixed-tune radios to businesses all around the Delaware Valley. You may have seen one when you came in. They're still around. Our chief engineer gets them sent in to us every year. We fix them and send them back out to these clients. So Jerry, it still lives today. Dave Kurtz and Jerry Lee walked through the doors of B101 with a positive outlook and a spring in their step. And quite frankly, their enthusiasm was contagious. B101 soon gained the reputation of its owners. It became a warm and friendly place to work with uncompromising integrity. Through the years, B101 has earned the highest respect of, of, of its colleagues in the industry. Today we celebrate 50 years because of our fearless leaders, Jerry and Dave, but also because of our extraordinary staff who bring their A-game to work every day. We are only as strong as our infrastructure. Today we celebrate our humble beginnings our rise to success, and the future of B101 as we move past the half century mark. And I say to all of you, full steam ahead. <laughs> Richard Wyckoff couldn't join us today. You're going to get some speakers going to be coming up, but Richard Wyckoff couldn't join us today. I believe his daughter had a baby and he had to run out of town, which is a good reason not to be here. Uh, but Richard sent a note uh, he wanted me to read for you to you all. Uh, my congratulations to Jerry Lee and the Kurtz family. I've had the pleasure of working with Jerry since I joined the NAB's legal staff in 1974. Jerry is the longest sitting NAB board member. He joined our board in 1972 and was recently recognized with a lifetime appointment as the Pennsylvania Association of Broadcasters Director Emeritus. Jerry Lee, 
you are one of a kind. On behalf of our industry, association, and listeners, thank you for your courage, foresight, leadership, and dedication to keep America, America, America's radio to industry the finest in the world. Fittingly, our first speaker, Marlon Taylor, was also the first employee hired by Dave Kurtz in 1963. He served as a station manager and program director for then WDVR-FM. He was a key player in the early success of the station. I'll, no, I'll now turn the mic over to Marlon as he gives us some insight into what it was like at the beginning. Marlon? Thank you all. It's a joy to be here. I'll try to keep my remarks at least no more than 15 minutes or so. Uh, <laughs> well, 50 years, certainly a long time. Of course, in the annals of radio, 50 is a short time, but why would we honor a station at 50 years? I think this one, because it's been a prominent station in this market ever since its first day on the air. And uh, I'm not taking credit for near all the success because, uh, by any means, because my actual involvement with the staff was only four years out of the first six that the station was on the air. And uh, although I was came back and involved in music programming and consulting with the station in the 1980s. Uh, many years ago, I was given a brass plaque which reads, to outdistance our competition we have to out-innovate them. And I see that as being a major key to this station's success, and I hope Jerry would agree, uh, as well as my own over the last half century. In the beginning years, I was the inside man, as uh, Blaze said, programming, handling staff, traffic, billing, and the like. Jerry was the outside, bringing in the sales uh, to keep us going and make us profitable. Uh, when I first saw the station's facilities, in Germantown, it was completely built and they'd have it ready to broadcast. The only thing missing was a staff to bring it to life. And Dave Kurtz hired me because two years earlier, I had done essentially the same thing in Washington, D.C., put a brand new small FM station on the air that was to be run by a minimal staff. And like with Dave, it was built by two engineers who Otherwise, we're not involved in broadcasting. And speaking of Dave, Esther, it's so wonderful to see you again after all these years. I remember Jerry and I drove out to Strasburg for your wedding, which was just a month, right? Just a month after the station went on the air. And another interesting thing, we began with a staff of only seven people, which really is a bare minimum to operate a non-automated station of that day, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It was Jerry and myself and five board operators who I would train eventually to write and do newscasts. And I think it's also interesting, 50 years later, four of those seven people are in the room today. <laughs> Wherever they are, Joaquin Bowman and Dave Shayer, who both are longtime members of uh, this association. And they were, of course, exciting times. We had, uh, to paraphrase that old children's book, some of you may have read when you were young, about a steam locomotive, which said the little station that could and did, is the way I paraphrased it. And we went on the air with a, new, with a unique programming sound. We had at least two charter advertisers, thanks to Jerry in a medium that yet had yet to really take off. And we had a signal that was far from the best in the market. Yet, it wasn't long before we were number one in the Hooper ratings. Anybody remember Hooper ratings? Uh, <laughs> because we offered a consistent sound 24 seven with a sound that people, music programming that people really wanted to listen to. And we were consistent with it where many stations in those days were still block programmed. So how did we attract an audience? I wonder, does anybody in the room remember these guys, if you can see them, called an FM dial card. 
Jerry, I'm not sure where you dug up the idea. I don't think you created it, but it came from somewhere, and we made good use of it. What did we do? At least a half million of these cards or more? Two million. Two million. And the key to it was if you, if you took a pile of cards to a store and put it on the counter, where do they go? On the floor and the track. Jerry created a little cardboard holder that held about 150 of those cards, and we placed them in any kind of a store that would sell an FM radio of any kind. And the store owners at that time loved them because one of their key things to sell at that time were FM radios because the market was far from saturated at that time. In our early days at WDBR, all of our voices heard on the station were recorded mostly by outside freelancers. A couple of months in, we began with a short weather cast and then evolving into newscasts. And the challenge was, as Dave Shayer mentioned in the recent newsletter, uh, when you do a newscast and you don't have a, a wire service, how do you do it? Well, we again innovated. We put three radio receivers in the back room, uh, attuned to three different stations in the market that had good news services, uh, brought those up to a patch panel behind the control operator, and he plugged at the right time one of those into a tape recorder, a reel-to-reel -reel recorder. Anybody remember them? Uh, <laughs> he would record the newscast, play it back one story at a time, and then paraphrase it in about a sentence. And that's how we'd create a newscast of three or four stories. And we only did newscasts, weathercasts, about every three hours other than the morning hours. And uh, that went along fine until November 22nd, 1963. What happened that day? Assassination. Kennedy assassination. Well. We realized then we needed a real news service. Mike Strug, Mike Strug was one of the, one of the people on duty that day, uh, right at the time of uh, Kennedy's assassination. He, he became one of those people uh, doing the newscast and covering that. We did some number of unique things over that weekend, but I won't get into them. Uh, we will move uh, on. In early 1965, with a number of advertisers continuing to grow, it was time that we had an experienced announcer on staff, so we hired a gentleman from Trenton named Phil Stout. And as time went by, Phil would learn my approach to programming our format and become my replacement when, in early 1966, as Marlon has been wont to do over the years, I got bored and itchy, time to find new territory to conquer. Jerry stayed here and conquered this territory knew uh, and over and over again successfully, I went on. By the way, Blaze, what better name for the a name of a general manager of a station which has been blazing new trails for 50 years, okay? <laughs> and, and before I forget it, I need to acknowledge my dear wife back there, Alicia. She was not with me during uh, uh, the WDBR days, but we've been married now for 38 years, so I think it's going to last. Uh, <laughs> well, anyway, to get things wrapped up here, about two years after the day I left, uh, Jerry sent then, do I mention his name? Jerry Michaels, uh, <laughs> to find me in Boston and urge me to come back to the station because things had changed and Phil Stout had been hired away. So, uh, when I had an opportunity to return to the city of brotherly love with a gold Cadillac awaiting me, who wouldn't return? <laughs> so I came back in as program director and very quickly I learned there were several other things that uh, were going to be part of my duties and one of them, I don't know if Jerry will talk about it a little later, but was the $101,000 giveaway. Can anybody who's been around a while forget that? Well, it quickly became my duty to deliver the $1,000 checks to the winners. And we really did give away $1,000. And let me read this so that I don't say it wrong. I can tell you that from some of the places that I had to visit to deliver these checks, these checks were likely lifesavers for any number of those people who would get handed that $1,000 check. Once everything was again squared away at the station, after less than a year, it was time to me pack up and move on again, leave it to the other people. And that's just part, I went on to New York City to conquer some other territory. 
That's just my small part of 65 years of radio broadcasting memories, and I grew up in Bucks County, so I remember in the 1940s, by Som and Bill Campbell calling not only the Phillies games, but the athletics games as well. They were still here at, at that time. And I'll always be proud of my involvement with and contributions to the success of 101.1. And I thank you for allowing me to share these memories. Thanks, Marlon. That was terrific remarks. Uh, next, I'd like to welcome Alan Kalish. Alan uh, is in the Broadcast Hall of Fame here, Broadcast Pioneers Hall of Fame. He is, I say he still is and was, the biggest name in advertising in this market. When I used to walk by their offices, I would genuflect. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who aren't Catholic, I can show you that later. He was the founder and former president of Kalish and Rice, a full service, ad, full service ad agency, which clients included Strawbridge and Clothier, Philadelphia Electric, Pep Boys, Wawa, and many, many, many more. He also served a term as president of the Philadelphia Ad Club. I was so delighted he would be here today. And Alan, would you please come up and share your remarks with us? Thank you. Thank you very much, Blaze. Uh, it's very nice to be here. I have good news and I have bad news. The bad news is that I remember every single thing that has, was already referred to, <laughs> even, even the Philadelphia Athletics. <laughs> That's the bad news. I, did I say bad news? The good news is that I've been given three minutes to talk. <laughs> well, I ask you this, Blaze. How can you take 50 years and then talk about it in three minutes? So I have to do it a little different way. I can't give you the history of the station, although I do remember the first client that we ever put on the station that had to do with Gerhards of Glenside. Perhaps you've heard of them. I understand that they're still on the station, and if so, I expect a 15% commission. <laughs> <laughs> And th in thinking about what to say today, I understood that you're absolutely going to hear a lot of things about the station and about Jerry. Uh, I know the only reason I'm here is because Jerry and I share one thing. <laughs> uh, he's better looking. What can I do? I can't. <laughs> that reminded me of a story that I want to tell you that happened over in South Jersey a couple of weeks ago took place in a first, first grade class, you know, where the kids are sitting around in the little desks, and uh, it was art time. So the teacher passed out the colored paper and the crayons, and then, as a good teacher, she was walking around the room and honoring the kids and congratulating them. She went over to Betty's little drawing, and she said, oh, Betty, that's such a beautiful butterfly. The colors are so vibrant. You're doing a wonderful job. Keep it up. Very nice. She went over to Joe. She said, Joey, that's a great airplane. I see that you put an American flag on it. It's very nice. Keep working. Then she went over to Johnny. Johnny was scribbling around with all the, all the crayons and just making a big mess. And she said, that, that's very colorful, Johnny. It's very nice. You should be proud of that. By the way, what is it? He said, well, it's a picture of God. She said, oh, well, it's lovely. Keep it up. She said, but you know, nobody really knows what God looks like. He said, they will now. Uh, okay, now, why did, that, why did that come to mind? Well, it came to mind because when you start talking about the facts of this station and of this person, Mr. Jerry Lee, you're just going to learn and learn and learn and learn. So let me just tell you some of the things that I think. If you've been here, if you're here, you probably have experienced Jerry in some way. You certainly have read about him. You've benefited because of Jerry. 
If you have any feelings like those that I have, you want to thank Jerry Lee for his courage, for his foresight, and for coming to Philly, and for staying the course. Jerry is and always will be the Energizer Bunny. More, more succinctly, maybe, we ought to call him the Radio Rabbit. <laughs> you know why, don't you? There's no stopping Jerry Lee, no stopping. He'll continue to dream, to lead, to give of himself, to teach, and to make us feel good just to know him. Thank you very much, Jerry. <laughs> Jerry knows how to think, how to plan, how to solve problems. Thank you, Jerry. Jerry also has a heart, a basic goodness. It just seems to be sort of an infinite merger between his heart and his brain. You know what he is? He's a nice guy. He's a quintessential nice guy. He can be tough, but he can always be direct and always honest. He's a nice guy. Thank you, Jerry. Most important, of course, that he puts the characteristics together that you all know about, that you've read about. I mean, if I were to try to list the charitable activities and the good things that he's done, it would take me three hours, not three minutes. So I say one thing again. Thank you, Jerry. I asked the group here to say with me, Thank you, Jerry. Uh, let's, let's, do it. let's do it one more time. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Alan. I really appreciate it, you being here today. Our next speaker, Alan Tempest, is president of Tempest Communications and the executive director of the Philadelphia Ad Club. He has worked with B101 for years through his various management positions with Clements Markets, Gennardi's Family Markets, and Campbell's Soup. Please join me in welcoming a good friend of mine and a good friend of the station, Alan Tempest. This is what I get following the best and well-known copywriter and from Philadelphia that Philadelphia's ever known. Thank you, Alan, for a very inspiring talk. At least I have the same first name. But I do want to say a few words, and uh, I'm sure we've all heard the sayings. I'm sure we've all heard the sayings, it's better to give than to receive. What goes around comes around. And more aptly put, when you give to others, you seem to always get something back. Well, these statements are totally true when it comes to Jerry Lee and B101. Never have I seen the giving theory, as it's called, demonstrated so vividly than through Jerry Blaze and the entire station team. I've known B101 for several years and in many capacities. I first met Blaze Howard and Agnes Fuller when I was a client. When they talked to me about radio, they did it by asking how could they help my advertising efforts and how could they help grow the business I was responsible for building. They weren't focused on standard things like number of spots or size of budget. Later, I had the pleasure of getting to know Jerry Lee after I became involved in the Philly Ad Club. Jerry and Blaze were interested in helping rebuild what was then a struggling organization by offering both their time and financial support. They gave so the organization could get back on its feet and become what it is now the largest trade association in the greater Philadelphia area. You notice, Jerry, I didn't say planet. And more recently, I've known B101 as a consultant. For the past few years, I've had the absolute pleasure of working with the management team of B101 on various projects 
that all have to do with making radio commercials more impactful and the industry more of a sales producing medium. Over and over again, I've heard Jerry say, Halley wants to make radio, the radio industry a premier medium through the use of research, excuse me, research and proven techniques that can enhance the advertiser's ROI. I began to believe that emotional engagement was actually Jerry's middle name, as he is both personally engaging and in constant pursuit of making the commercials that run on radio equally so. Each one of these experiences I've had with B101 has proven the station's desire to put the interest of others first, as a client, as a trade organization, and as an industry. And each time I experienced this sense of giving, I have been increasingly impressed by the energy put forth and the opportunity to witness the benefits that came back each time in return. I'm a true believer and an avid fan of this now 50-year-old station, just at the cusp of its beginning. Congratulations, Jerry, Blaze, Agnes, and the whole organization on a job well done, and best wishes for the next 50 years and beyond. Thanks, Alan. The check is in the mail. Uh, appreciate that. Uh, we have a little change in the program here. I want to invite up two gentlemen that were here in 1963, Joaquin Bowman and Dave Sh Schreier. Schreier. And we'd like you to come up and, and say a few words now, if you wouldn't mind. They were here right at the beginning. Are they here? Oh, here they come. Uh, <clears throat> me. When they uh, called me earlier this year and said they're going to be tributing uh, B101, I didn't realize it would be to such an extent, and I'm really honored. I was, along with Joaquin, first, the first, uh, one of the first voices on the station on the first day. So um, I went looking around at some old stuff that I've been carrying around for years, and I found this. This is the news release here. It's an immediate release from Jerry Lee, promotion manager. Philadelphia, May 13th, 1963. The Delaware Valley's first 24-hour FM stereo station, WDVR, today began regular broadcasting operations. Programming will be devoted exclusively to bright, familiar music with every selection easy to recognize. The station will present 55 minutes of music in every hour around the clock, which is more music in every hour than any other station in the Philadelphia area. WDVR has studios, transmitter, and offices located at 18 West Chelton Avenue in Germantown. It operates at 101.1 megacycles on the FM dial with 5,000 watts of power. Owner of the station is David L. Kurtz, an electronics engineer with the Philco Corporation. Mr. Kurtz resides in Germantown and is just 30 years old. He personally obtained the permit from the Federal Communications Commission for the station, selected its equipment, and chose the station's staff. Station manager is Marlon R. Taylor, a native of Feasterville, Bucks County. Mr. Taylor was most recently with an FM station in Bethesda, Maryland. Sales manager is Jerry Lee, who came to WDVR from Baltimore. Other staff members include Frank Goshi from Cheltenham, Richard Franklin, Ambler, David Shayer, an Overbrook Hills resident, Alan Campbell of Drexel Hill, Louis Klawanski, Philadelphia, and Joaquin Bowman of Germantown. The businesses that are presenting the first all-night FM stereo program in the Delaware Valley are John B. White Ford and the Philco Corporation. And the final note is from the editor, your welcome visitor at the WDVR studios. So, uh, hmm? oh no, it's a photocopy. Yeah, yeah, well so am I, but that's, uh, anyway, anyway, uh, just briefly, it's a very, it's an honor to be 
affiliated with a station that was so successful and made a national reputation for itself so early. Uh, and it's a personal note, too, that a number of people who I've mentioned on here and others I've now known for 50 years and I'm close friends with, and that's uh, a long time. Uh, and also, when you're on the radio, you never really know who is listening at any given time. I was at a high school reunion a few years back, and a woman saw my name tag and said, oh, I used to listen to you back in the 60s. And I'm just finding out about it now, so you never know who's out there. And on a personal note, that's very, that's very flattering and very rewarding. So again, uh, it was a great run. I was there for a number of years. And congratulations, Jerry and everyone, for a great 50 and 50 more. I was uh, 19 years old when uh, I walked in the door of WDBR in Germantown. And Marlon Taylor, I think he took sympathy on me because he gave me a job. <laughs> I had no voice. I still don't have a voice. And had no radio presence. I was going to Temple and worked on WRTI. And Marlon said, well, I guess if you work on WRTI, we can do something with you here. And he was very, very gracious. He put me on the midnight shift. <laughs> now, the only thing I had to do was the main thing, Marlon, you told me to stay awake. <laughs> and I did. Because I was able to go to Temple during the day, see my girlfriend in the early evening hours, and then report to work and work my midnight shift. And I did stay awake. I slept during classes. Um, <laughs> That opportunity that Marlon gave me really set the stage for the rest of my life. Um, I worked at WDBR. Um, I also worked at WIBF. Um, I went on to, I just made, I sort of made a list because, you know, memorizing everybody's name. I worked uh, at IBF with Alan Scott and Taylor Grant, who were doing the news on television. I also worked with Pat Stanton for a brief period on the Irish Hour. I worked with Frank Ford uh, later on, and we did a program called SEPTA on Call on WDVT. And after I retired from SEPTA in 1996, I started a program on WBUX called What's New in Antiques, because I love antiques, and I decided to do a little show on it. Now, I gave Jerry the complete archives for that program. I gave them to Jerry today to be preserved with the broadcast pioneers. So it's been a great ride. And after uh, I retired from SEPTA, I taught. I taught in the public school system. I taught elementary kids. I uh, taught kids with uh, special needs. And um, I had a tremendous career. I owe it all to Marlon Taylor. Being in radio opened so many doors for me. I mean, people didn't know I did the midnight shift and I was a board operator. They thought, oh, well, you worked in radio. It must have been a big deal. You must be somebody special. It, it opened doors for me for the rest of my life. Um, and as you give scholarships, you talked about $51,000 in scholarships to kids. Marlon gave me a scholarship. He gave me a scholarship by providing a job opportunity, and I'll always be grateful. Thank you, Marlon. I brought, I brought one other thing. When I cashed my first check from WDBR, I saved the first dollar that the teller gave me from Gerard Trust and Corn Exchange Bank in Germantown. This is that dollar. <laughs> and it was dated, uh, the check was dated May 20th, 1963. And I always regret that Jerry Lee didn't have like a profit sharing program. <laughs> but we didn't. Wouldn't that have been great? Now Dave Shayer said that dollar probably was the sum total of your paycheck. <laughs> so it might have been. Thank you very much.
it, it truly is great to hear those stories. Uh, thank you so much for sharing it with us. I really appreciate it. Our next speaker is uh, David Kurtz. He is the son of the founder of uh, 101.1, the frequency, the late David Kurtz. He currently serves as general manager of AJM Capital Partners and manager director of KMS Capital Group. Dave is a graduate of William Penn Charter School, the University of Pennsylvania, and got his MBA from Penn State. He also serves as a board member of the Kurtz Family Foundation. Dave, we're so glad you're here with your family. Would you please come up and say a few words? Thank you very much, Blaze, for the introduction. Great to see all these people here. It's unbelievable. Um, first off, I'd like to thank broadcast pioneers, Jerry Lee, Blaze Howard, and all the great B101 folks for inviting us here today. Um, I'm joined by my mother, Esther, um, sister Ellen, wife Jennifer, brother-in-law Steve Smith, and my daughter Anna, who's now going to be a second time B101 intern this summer. And last but not least, uh, my nephew Jacob, who also interned at B101, he could not be here today because he's a high school student. So anyhow, great to be here. Thank you. Um, my father, David Kurtz, founded WDBR in 1963, um, which was a year before I was born. Yes, that means I'm not quite 50, but I'm darn close. Too close. <laughs> so in many, many ways, the station really was his first child and probably less trouble than Ellen to me. Certainly less trouble than me, I guarantee that. Um, for my sister and I growing up, the radio station was really the only thing we ever knew. It was our life and our family. Um, we would often visit the office, and we're involved in this strange family ritual. Um, every Sunday afternoon, we would go to this grassy, buggy, tower-filled field in Roxborough. <laughs> and what my dad would do, he would go and start up this huge, giant diesel backup generator, which would make all kinds of racket and scare the hell out of us. And uh, as kids, we found this very puzzling. We just didn't know what this was all about. Um, we were thinking, why do we do this? And I wondered if other kids spent their Sundays in a similar manner. I'm thinking probably not. Um, growing up, I remember finally the various office social events and the dinners at the houses of various employees. I think we were actually at Martin Taylor's house when I was a young kid. Um, saw many great folks come and go over the years, excellent employees. Um, Everybody seemed to love my dad. Yes, you did. <laughs> thank you, thank you. <clears throat> and um, as you all know, my dad was a super electronics geek. And you could tell he really enjoyed messing around with all the gear in the station day and night. Um, just couldn't just get enough of that. And he was the only person I know to this day that actually built TVs and radios from kits. <laughs> I assume nobody does that anymore with uh, modern technology, but that was just one of his things that I felt was strange that everybody's father did, evidently not. Um, and with, with him around the house, a solder gun was the remedy for every household issue. <laughs> I, to this day, I wouldn't touch one of those things. They terrify me, but um, <laughs> he was big on the soldering. Um, and it, no detail for him was too small regarding the broadcast operations. Um, I recall, and many of you do, I'm not sure when this happened exactly, w when the station moved to Domino Lane on the what I call the big tower. Uh, he was very excited about this, and he recruited me to paint this cinder block building that was on the site. <laughs> I'm not sure why this happened, but uh, it turned out to be one of the worst experiences of my entire existence. Uh, it was hotter than hell. It was this little cinder block box, and we were painting with paint rollers, and as we painted, paint and little fragments of cinder block were stuck all over us. So by, by the end of the day, we were a little covered head to toe in paint and cinder block. So it was just, who knows why. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why he felt compelled to do this, but uh, he did. He wanted to do it himself. He dragged me into it and just sort of speaks to the kind of character he had in terms of just not, no task was too small for him to undertake, and I was happy to uh, help him out. 
So I guess uh, in addition to having fun with the uh, broadcasting gear and the employees and the towers and all the geeky stuff, um, my dad also loved playing first base on the baseball team, or softball team, I should say. I'm not sure if that team still exists or when it may have ceased, but um, <laughs> and, and anyhow, he, he loved playing first base. Not a Ryan Howard quality player, but uh, it was something he really loved doing. All the employees seemed to have a great time. I used to go to games frequently and got dragged into a couple, actually myself, and played. Um, so, so we'll wrap things up. In summary, thank you to everybody who invited us, you know, the Kurtz family. Um, happy 50th to B101, amazing milestone. And congratulations to Jerry Lee and the staff, great folks. And um, just thank you for letting me share memories of my dad. Duct tape. <laughs> Solder gun, I wouldn't touch it either. Duct tape, try it. It works for everything. You got a real kind of insight as to what a great man he is when his son can get up here and talk about him and the emotion of it all. And I know that all the employees here feel the same way. He was a great man, and we loved him dearly. We all wouldn't be here if it wasn't for him. Yeah. Amen. Well, we have one final speaker, and I guess you can guess who it is. It's not me. It's Jerry Lee. Yeah. Jerry Lee is a visionary. His way of thinking is unique and uncommon in the broadcasting industry and in the business world. I refer to him as a one-man think tank. Jerry is also a kind and giving man who is interested in improving the future of radio as well as improving the future of the world around him. His illustrious career is full of accomplishments. I will name just a few in radio. I don't know if you know this, but he helped develop the concept of the Broadcast Minority Fund. This fund was responsible for $100 million in loans made possible to minorities so that they could buy broadcast properties. This guy was instrumental in making that happen. The next two I kind of really like. Jerry Lee created the Arbitron Advisory Council. This was the first time that Arbitron actually interacted with the council from radio executives. Prior to that, they just yelled at each other and screamed and sent bad letters. He also was instrumental in the redesign of the diary when we used to have it to improve the accuracy of that work listening. Jerry has always been passionate about education and crime. The following is another small of example of, his major, of some of the major achievements. In 2000, he established the Jerry Lee Center of Criminology at the University of Pennsylvania. Today, the center is the foremost organization dedicated to the research roots and cause of crime and terrorism. In 2004, the US Senate confirmed Jerry's appointment by President George W. Bush to serve a four-year term on the National Board of Education Sciences. He was the only non-teacher that was appointed to this board. And in 2006, Jerry funded the Stockholm Prize in Criminology. It was the first prize of its kind given to the best research done in helping to solve crime in the world. It is presented in the same venue as the Nobel Prize by the Minister of Justice in Sweden. He was also knighted by the King of Sweden for this. So if you call him Sir Jerry, it kind of makes, we, that's what we call him at work. <laughs> Jerry, is one, uh, Jerry is one of the finest men that I know. Throughout the years, Jerry has always remained true to himself and to his personal mission, which is to work for the good of this radio station for the good of the radio broadcasting industry, and for the greater good of all humanity. I'm honored to work for a man who has his heart and soul in the right place. It's my great pleasure to introduce Mr. Jerry Lee.
Thank you. Thank you very much. I tell you, it just, it's incredible to think it's been 50 years. To me, it's like yesterday. I, uh, of course, I can't remember the past. I tell the story about how people can say anything about something that happened 20 years ago. They can make it up, and I believe it. I can't remember. <laughs> but I tell everybody I, I can remember the future. That's my talent. At any rate, I'd like to start off by introducing my family. I'd like to have Laura and her, and her husband Dave stand up. Okay. Okay. And, and Marjorie and her husband Ed. Okay. 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 Well, first and foremost, I want to pay tribute to Dave Kurtz. He was the best partner that anyone could ever imagine. Dave and I had a wonderful collaboration. Our success was based on mutual trust and respect. He truly was a great man. I will forever be grateful for this partnership. I'd also like to thank the Kurtz family for being here today to celebrate the 50th anniversary. You will always be part of the B101 family and Dave will forever be in our hearts. His vision don't forget, he's the one that came up with the vision to start this station when people didn't, they thought FM was worthless, which it was, uh, but he proved it wrong. And uh, he, he, his vision lives on in the station with the employees really every day. B101 has a rich history. Uh, and one of the first things that, probably the most important thing in the history was the first meeting. What happened, I saw in Broadcasting Magazine that Dave Kurtz had just gotten a license to put an FM on the air in Philadelphia. I called him on the phone and persuaded him to have lunch with me. And after an hour and a half, he kept looking at his watch and I said, you know, what's, what's the problem? He said, I gotta get back to work at Philco. He was an engineer there working on anti-submarine detection devices. In fact, very few people know this, but he had several patents on anti-submarine detection devices. Uh, so there's more size than Dave than people know. Uh, so what happened at this lunch, he had to go back to work and I says, Dave, I'm only in time for the day. Could we have dinner at seven o'clock? He said, okay. We go out to dinner and by 10 o'clock, this is almost hard to imagine this is possible. By 10 o'clock that night, we had a three-year contract written on the back of a napkin. And the crucial word or uh, sentence in this contract was that I could be fired at the end of the year one if we weren't the number one FM station in Philadelphia. And I gulped and I signed the contract. <laughs> and the fr now, let me turn back to Dave for a second. Dave has been, had been saving for years. I mean, he really was living like a pauper. He wouldn't get married until he saved enough money to put the station on the air, and he got married within a month afterwards. Uh, and the, the amount of money we had to start the station he had was uh, $28,500, but which is really 210,000 in today's dollars. And we had enough money to operate for about 60 days, and then we're gonna be out of business. We had, uh, and this is the days when FM was totally worthless, all the money, 96% of the money, went to AM radio. I desperately wanted to be the first 24-hour day stereo station because I had this vision that on Friday and Saturday night, people would stay up later in midnight when everybody would be playing the Star Spangled Banner. Guess what? If we were 24 hours a day, we'd be on the air and we would get listeners and it worked big time. Within 45 days, we were the number one FM station in Philadelphia. It was all due to the fact that we were able to go 24 hours a day. Now, when I was discussing this with Dave, they said, well, Jerry, you realize we have no money. We, it's, we, can, we can barely operate 18 hours a day, let alone 24 hours a day. He said, if you're, you can get a sponsor, then I'm okay with that. And I still don't know how he did this till did it, but I got both Philco and John B. White Ford to sponsor the all night show so we could go 24 hours a day. And that was probably the most significant thing 
I did in the early days at the station. Now, in the early days, we were in a loft in, the, in Germantown. We were on the top of a, the first Pennsylvania bank building. We were not the top floor. We were beyond the top floor. <laughs> and there were low-hanging pipes everywhere. In fact, the pipes were so low in places that the standing joke that even the mice were hunchback. <laughs> in May of, of 1967, we moved from the low rent district in, in Germantown to Bella Kenwood. And in those days, of course, if you watch Mad Men, you'll, you'll know this. In those days, people in advertising drank like fishes. I mean, it just terrible. So when I, I had this idea, I said, and I, I, I never forget Dave's reaction to this. I said, Dave, we got to put a bar in the radio station. He says, what? <laughs> I says, trust me, it's going to make money. <laughs> and so we put this bar in the radio station, and we started to invite clients to lunch. And business started to boom. Then in September 1967, Dave and I sat down with the staff and we said, hold on to your seats. We have decided that we're going to double the business in the next 12, in 19, 1968, we're going to double the business. Now, everybody was absolutely shocked out of their skins for this. I said, but I said, wait a minute, any idea that you have that can help us get to this goal, we're going to do. Anything that has any possibility of work, working, we will do. So the first thing we did, we went out and said, hmm, FM's a loser. How do we separate ourselves? Not to be AM, not to be FM, but be something else. So we gave all of our salespeople these Cadillacs. And then what we did, as Marlon mentioned earlier, we conducted the first big sweepstakes in the history of radio, $101,000 sweepstake. That was the first biggest one ever in radio. And then what happened, we, no self-respecting AM rep firm would represent an FM station. They just wouldn't do it because FM was worthless. Well, don't ask me how I did it, but I persuaded the number one rep firm to represent us we ended 1968, we, you know, our goal was to double the, the business. We not only doubled the business, we actually tripled it. Uh, you can never do anything like that again. Now, you know, Dave and I have always been willing to take risk. Uh, that's part of the way we have always operated the station. And we were able to prove to the world that independently, you know, single FM could take on the big guys and win. And uh, we were nationally recognized throughout the country. In fact, we're considered the most imitated FM station in the country. And in the past 50 years, we've only changed format once. We changed from beautiful music to at all contemporary in 1989. So uh, we're very stable. We don't change much. We have been, B101 has been recognized by its peers with eight Marconi Awards, including one called Legendary Station Award, which you only get once. And, but I'll tell you, all of this that we've been able to do is really testament to the work ethic of our staff. And I want to thank our staff, present and, and past, for everything that they put into making this station successful. I'd also like to have all the B101 present employees, past employees, Kurt's family, and my family to stand and be recognized. Please. Okay. I, I'm going to end with one thing. Go ahead, sit, you can sit there. <laughs> end with one thing. 
and that is, I just want to briefly talk about my Vice President and General Manager, Blaze Howard. <laughs> Blaze is the best manager that I have ever had. I am lucky to have a man of such talents running the station. I do not run the station. Blaze runs the station. I throw in the big ideas, but he runs the station. Yeah. Blaze is the only general manager in my 50 years that is totally open to new ideas. He's been with me 16 years. That's why we get along so great. Every other manager was frightened to death about my ideas. He grabs onto them and makes them happen. And one other thing, and that is, we laugh all the time. <laughs> On behalf of B101 Radio, I'd like to thank the broadcast pioneers for making this happen today. Thank you very much. We have several presentations to make. The first, Broadcast Pioneers of Philadelphia salutes B101 and Jerry Lee for a half century of serving the Philadelphia market with one of the top American radio stations of all time. Jerry. We, we would like David Kurtz to come up and accept this on behalf of the Kurtz family. It says, very similar. It says, 50 years of success, broadcast pioneers of Philadelphia salutes B101 and the David Kurtz family for a half century of serving the Philadelphia market with one of the top American radio stations of all time. Thank you very much. Very kind. Thank you. And finally, Broadcast Pioneers of Philadelphia honors the staff, management, and ownership of B101. We salute 50 years of success and wish them centuries more as a leader in broadcasting in the United States. I just want to tell you I appreciate everybody that came today. The Kurtz family, thank you so much. Jerry's family, thank you to the Lee family. Well, not the Lee family, different last names, but the girls, thanks for coming. And some of our clients, Mike Gillespie, thank you very much for showing up today. We really appreciate it.